Well, um, welcome everybody. And uh, I say everybody, I think we have around 55 participants at the moment to this webinar. Um, I'm Martin Postel, I'm Deputy Director for Grants and Publications at Mellon, and uh, it's my great pleasure to, to chair uh, this session, uh, Authors of Architecture, which is our latest in the series, British Art and Natural Forces, this, this wonderful and very ambitious program uh, that's been devised uh, by my colleague Anna Reid with events which have already occurred and I know some of you will have attended those uh, which will be going on until really early December. The last one is the we have a panel discussion on the 3rd of December uh, but plenty of events before that. I think we have at least another seven after today's session so do have a look at those carefully. There's still time to sign up and uh, so um, have a look at our web page and you'll see all the details there. Um, I think we can get started because it's my clock so six minutes past 12. So shall we just run through, I need to, to run through um, a few little housekeeping things before we get to the main business. Um, so if you could just take a look at that, uh, which you'll see on the screen now, I won't go through absolutely everyone, everything. Uh, essentially, we'll have, we've got four presentations, four papers, they're each going to last 20 minutes, and we're going to do them in um, uh, two um, so we will have the first one, the second one, then we'll have 10 minutes of questions relating to those two papers, then we'll have another two, and then 10 minutes relating to the second pair of papers, and then whatever time we've got left over, we can open it out to talk about all the papers. That, that's the format, so we'll, you know, we will keep it, we'll keep it moving along briskly um, in order to, to let everyone have an opportunity to say what they need to do. Uh, use the Q&A box, if you want to ask and write a question, I'll be looking at that, and so will Ella and, and, and my other colleague Danny. Uh, so I'll keep an eye on that. So if you do have a question, uh, we'll um, use that. And then, of course, use the chat box um, if you want to make any comments or if you have any problems or you can't hear or see or anything like that. Okay. Um, and I think everything else is self explanatory. We are recording it, um, but, uh, and that will be kept in the, in the PMC archive. Uh, but we none of us um, must take photographs. So that's that's basic housekeeping rules. And uh, I'm joined by our speakers. I, I think you can see them, our, our four speakers on the screen uh, there. And uh, Freya, uh, Ewan, Alicia and Jonathan. And uh, that's the order in which the presentations are going to take place. So. I think without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Freya Wigsell, and she's just finishing or completing her doctorate at the Bartlett at University College London. UCL features prominently today, as you'll see. And uh, she's going to be talking about an interest, or a widespread interest in shells, something we, we kind of take for granted, I think, in 20th century uh, architecture. So Freya, shall I just hand over to you? Um, I'm going to meet myself, and uh, I suggest the rest of us mute ourselves and uh, it's, it's eight minutes past 12, okay? Okay, hello everyone. Just gonna share my screen. Okay. Um, hi everyone. So my title, Piling Up the Debris, uh, it's not the most informative, but the talk is going to be about the roach bed Portland stone cladding on the Economist building in London. The building was commissioned by the Economist magazine and designed by the British architects, Alison and Peter Smithson, following a limited competition in 1959, and it was completed in 1964. It occupies a corner site between St. James's Street Ryder Street and Bury Street uh, between Green Park and Piccadilly. And it's now one of the most written about British buildings. The building scheme is made up of three towers of different heights, each with a different purpose. Um, you've got, a, got the Economist office block, which is right here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, you have the bank building, which is in the corner here, again showing you here, and just this sliver here is the residential block. And these are all around a central raised plaza. It was an unorthodox layout. Uh, the conventional practice for a commercial building at that time was to fill the whole site with a low single tower 
sorry, a low building with a single tower above, uh, like this one, which is a contemporary build New Zealand house, which is just down the road. Instead, with the agreement of the owners, the Smithsons and the Economist magazine created a design which gave each function a separate building grouped around an open, slightly raised public space of the plaza. Peter Smithson did all the exterior detailing himself um, and roach bed stone is the cladding for all three towers, the column cappings, the spandrels, steps, balustrades, and it was mixed into the concrete as an aggregate for the paving of the plaza. Roach uh, was another unorthodox choice because at the time the Smithsons used it, it was completely unprecedented. So what's special about Roach, and, and this is a close up of the Roach on the Economist building, is that you can see the evidence of the shells in it. The thousands of organisms that lived 150 million years ago, which built up over time, were compressed, and then have been dissolved into the limestone by acid groundwalkers, leaving these shell-shaped cavities. These impressions, indexical traces um, that mark the stone distinguish it from the much more common Whitbed Portland, which comes from the lower geological bed in the Portland sequence and is consequently more compressed, making it softer to cut, purer and whiter. Traditionally, roach was regarded as unusable for anything except rough work like sea defences, and it was generally discarded and left on the sides of quarries. It was hard to work and it was thought of as an ugly stone, stigmatised because of these cavities. Now the geologist Eric Robinson, who has written a lot about stone used in London buildings, has emphasised just how unprecedented the use of roach on The Economist was. And he says, in the 1960s, when others were working in the horror of shuttered concrete, the architects, the Smithsons, discovered roach. They found that in a modern building in which it was simply an external cladding, the porosity was not a major problem, while the rough surface texture lent a definite character to the finish. So they used roach extensively in an already innovative design. Other aspects of their design for a difficult setting won the acclaim and prizes for the architecture, as much would be accorded them with geologists for the largest surface area of Portland Roach to be seen anywhere in London, if not the South East, including the Portland Island. For this reason, 25 St. James's Street, the Plaza Walk area, and especially the shallow tread steps are places of pilgrimage in the capital. So the rest of my talk is really about why. Why did the Smithsons pick Roach when no one had ever picked it before? And what was it they liked about it? You know, what possible significance might it have for the building? It's my view um, that it's possible that the roach bed stone, far from being a choice arrived at after the form of the building had been arrived at, a kind of decorative dressing, was in fact a choice made much earlier and that we can see the buildings as a support for the stone, a structure devised to carry this very distinctive surface. And the roach potentially says something fundamental about the project, something that's not been developed before. So there's several well-known choices for the roach that have been documented, um, both by the Smithsons and others who worked with them on the buildings. So let's uh, quickly look at these. Part of the explanation for the choice of roach was to do with the developments in stone cutting technology. In the 1950s, diamond wire sawing made it possible for the first time to cut roach thinly, a change that is acknowledged by Peter Smithson. Other practicalities may have been the clients and planning requirements for a stone cladding, one that respected the surrounding Georgian and Edwardian architecture in St. James's Street, much of which is clad in Whitbed. In which case, the use of not the customary Portland stone, but a hitherto unused variety by the Smithsons might be seen as an innovative solution to the requirement, a kind of bending or playing with the rules while remaining within the brief. The other major rationale for the roach put forward both at the time of the building and reiterated more recently was to do with weathering and city pollution. Um, this is a photograph 
from the plaza facing the residential block before the stones cleaned in the 1990s. Peter Salter, who worked with the Smithsons and later um, the architectural historian Jonathan Hill, who's going to be talking in a minute, have both made the point that cavities in the Roach stone collected soot deposits from the surrounding atmosphere, and that this was part of the controlled staining of the building that interested the Smithsons. Salter emphasized how over time, the facade which originally had little modulation of its structure acquired great visual depth, understood through the control of shadows of soot and the scouring of the stone. Likewise, more recently, one of the assistants on The Economist, Timothy Tinker, has also flagged the effects of staining, noting that conventional Whitbed Portland stone did not, did not weather well, and the whole art of cleaning buildings in the early 1960s was in its infancy. So these very practical reasons um, technology, weather, the need for cladding, um, one actually that also uh, reflected the light into the, the space of the plaza. Um, what none of them do is refer to the Shelley characteristic of the stone, this scarring, which Robinson says gave the roach its definite character. Much later on in the 1990s, Peter Smithson referred to the shell pattern in the roach as pretty imbuing it with a kind of ornamental or decorative quality um, and suggesting that this was part of the appeal of the choice for him and Alison. And more recently still, their assistants, Timothy Tinker and also George Kasabov have also separately said the Smithsons chose the stone because of its liveliness and because it was honest, because you could see with the naked eye the organisms that had gone into its making. That then is the sum of what we know about why the Smithsons chose Roach Bed Stone and, and the story might, might end there and that might be the whole thing. But what I want to do now is put forward two other possible suggestions about why the Smithsons might have selected the stone. Suggestions that have some implications on how we might see the buildings more generally and which in particular draw upon the natural. These ideas come from conversations taking place in the independent group of which the Smithsons were members, and particularly between the Smithsons and their friends, the artists Eduardo Paolozzi and Nigel Henderson. So my first suggestion about the economist Roach has to do with the idea of a carapace or a casing, an external casing. During the 1950s, uh, Palazzi was making a series of sculptures that he described as things, fig not figures, things. Made of bronze, these sculptures were hollow and the surfaces were marked with the imprints of different types of throwaway obsolescent matter. Old toys, broken utensils, bits of machinery, which Palazzi had cast into the surface of the bronze, a process he described as damage, erase, destroy, deface, and transform, and the effect of which the critic Lawrence Alloway likened to a wall of fossils. The finished objects, these fragile things made out of the impressions of life's cast off, were also described in a language of violence and destruction. And this is a quote, something frightful had happened to them. They may have been blasted by a Hiroshima bomb or buried for decades and resurrected by accident. Now the art historian Hal Foster has suggested that although while at one level we can read Palozzi's figures as symbols of destruction, we might also read them as symbols of survival. Foster argues that the matter that makes up Palozzi's sculptures can be seen as analogous to a hypothesis Sigmund Freud puts forward in Beyond the Pleasure Principle in which Freud argues that in order to survive, every organism evolves a protective shield out of the stimuli it receives from the world, a kind of necrotic crust or shell that allows an organism to protect the nervous system at its core. I think it's, it's possible to make an analogy between Palozzi's figures um, and their textures and the roach on the Economist building, insofar as we can read the roach as a protective casing, but one unlike Palozzi's necrotic crust, which was made through a man-made method and through the accumulation of man-made cast-offs. The roach is of course made through natural forces and through the buildup of natural cast-offs. 
the suggestion of a casing of a natural equivalent to Palazzi sculptures works particularly if we think of the Economist Plaza not as an outside space, but an internal one, one that provides a kind of enclosure against the surrounding space of the city. The roach then becomes a crust or shell around the interior of each tower and also around the space of the plaza, providing that is a shield, a wall of fossils between the plaza and the city. And the image I'm showing you is just one I took last week um, of the plaza facing Ryder Street. And this here is Whitbed, the, the building you're looking at. Uh, I'm not suggesting um, the Smithsons knew about Freud's argument. There's, there's no evidence that they did, but the aesthetic it links to might have infiltrated that material selection by a palazzi. The Smithsons were ongoingly very preoccupied with human association, human structures and change. And I'm just going to pull out a few quotes of things they said over the years. Um, as they wrote in 1970 in Orderiness and Light, the first principle of town development should be continuous objective analysis of the human structure and its change. Earlier in 61, they spoke of the need to re-identify man with his environment that could no longer be achieved by using historical forms of house groupings, streets, squares, greens, because as a social reality, they no longer existed. And in 66, they discuss how their architecture was committed to some sort of social dialogue. So that's, that's my first proposition, um, a carapace, a means of creating a protective human shield or space by means of a necrotic crust formed not, not like Palazzi's sculptures of industrial human debris, but of a naturally created debris, the shells of mollusks that died millions of years ago. The second idea I want to propose about the roach is about pattern and a hidden order. And again, this resonates with artistic concerns happening during the period immediately prior to the Economist Commission. Um, I confess I haven't, I haven't found a clear way of talking about this, but I'm, I'm gonna give it a go. The, the idea of a, of a pattern comes out in relation to the concept of the as found. And it's a concept the Smithsons described in 1990 as a new way of seeing the ordinary. And it's included an interest in the patterns to be discovered in everyday life. And it's, it's a concept they say they got from Nigel Henderson, who in the 1950s was photographing, and this is very well known, photographing the environment around his home in Bethnal Green, including the marks and traces of wear and debris and patch ups, such as the arbitrary patterns that form through damage done to external walls. Now, underlying this idea of pattern and the as found was an interest in process. And this is a quote, the correspondence between appearance and actual material construction. But there was also a more elusive idea of a hidden order to things. Throughout this period, at least up until 1956, the as found according to the Smithson's latest statement was preoccupied with the discovery of a reality beneath appearances, an idea derived from James Joyce's epiphany, or in Henderson's case, the surrealist indebted concept of selective accident, a chance set of found phenomena, bringing about an order which you might ideally wished invented to create from scratch. Looking closely at the exhibition Parallel of Life and Art, an exhibition Henderson, Pelosi and the Smithsons collaborated on in 1953, the architectural historian Irene Scalbert has argued that many of the ideas present in the exhibition and the as found had been derived from the Parisian avant-garde. Figures such as Tristan Zara, uh, de Buffet and Henri Mouchot who sought to dispose of governing ideas of form, language, and beauty. These ideas were mediated through Palozzi and Henderson and others, both of whom had been in Paris in the 1940s. In particular, Scalbert notes how for the Parisian artists, works of art were cast-offs from the ceaseless flux of life. They were signs or impressions lifted from the formlessness of matter, and they encouraged the Smithsons to think of architecture as a debris of life. And these are quite um, elusive ideas, but I've got this drawing here by Henri Mouchot. And 
there is a kind of hidden order here, um, some kind of code that's inaccessible. The components that make it up, um, the ink markings, these signs, and the way they've been distributed on the page, there's a, there's a kind of structure to it, but it's not one that makes sense in terms of the conventional ways, um, as I understand it, that we organize things or any of the signs and symbols that we use. Now, again, the Smithsons never make a direct link between the As Found or the Paris, Paris avant-garde and Roach. Um, not even do they connect it to process, although Tim Tinker did. Um, but again, I, I think the aesthetics it links to are all very resonant with Roach. Scalbert's focus on the art, again, he's focused on artificial man-made things, not the patterns and subliminal associations that can be created through natural forces and natural chaos. But Roach, if we look at it, does have a close indexical relation to the substance from which it was made. One can see in the final substance of Roach the imprints of the organisms from which it was created. Shells, uh, the remains of organisms cast off from life, pile up on a beach or in the bed of a limestone in a random way, without any order to their arrangement, but be creating in that process a new pattern, a new order from the seeming chaos. In Roach, the shells are dissolved or transformed to then become traces, signs, impressions, but not things. And they are a literal take on an architecture as a debris of life, which is then built into more through the buildup of ephemeral waste, the marks of pollution, crisp packets, cigarette butts. So to very quickly wrap this up, um, in the 1960s, a world of rapidly advancing technologies and obsolescence, The Economist takes us abruptly into a pre-human world and its own order and its own pattern. And the Smithsons perhaps use this to curate a necrotic crust, a type of shell with which to protect the modern human from the consequences of industrialization and urbanization. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Freya, and uh, that was fantastic. Sorry about my phone ringing in the background, if anybody's wondering. It's not your mobile, it's my phone over there. Hopefully it'll stop in a moment. Um, I'm going to move straight on, because and that was beautifully timed. Um, you said uh, 20 minutes, and you did it in 19, so thanks so much. I'm going to move on now straight forward to uh, Ewan uh, Robson. Ewan, um, he finished his PhD in 2019 at uh, UCL and it was entitled A Cathedral Encountered Stories and Storytelling in Medieval Durham and I understand that that uh, PhD from that uh, thesis present presentation comes out of it. I'm very particularly looking forward to this because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cathedral I know well even featured in our school song our proud Durham's Tower Shrine. So uh, over to you Ian and uh, you've got uh, to 20 minutes. Well, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin. I hope you'll share that song with us later on. Um, and um, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can all hear me and um, by now um, see the title uh, slide of the PowerPoint. I'll just steal a brief moment um, to offer some additional and um, sincere thanks to everyone, uh, the event support team at the PMC, as well to Ella, um, to Danielle, to Anna, uh, for putting this program together. Thank you very much indeed. And Freya, that was such a fascinating paper. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, of, of all the papers I've given recently, I've actually been particularly looking forward uh, to this event and to this panel um, for reasons that I actually might briefly summarize as a way of um, getting us uh, started, of laying, a, uh, if you like, a, a little groundwork in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, methodology. Uh, before we get to the main um, subject at hand, uh, in this case, uh, Durham Cathedral and the um, Old English poem, De Situ Donelmi, um, which uh, will serve as a kind of lens through which um, we can look at it. Um, so uh, in, in the original call for contributions, the emphasis on the natural world, on um, uh, biological and ecological um, bodies of, of, of knowledge was inviting enough, um, but the repeated use of the term uh, encounter, one that features in my thesis uh, just mentioned uh, in the blurb, were really 
sharpened my interest. And that's to say, and I think I can quote verbatim here, the encounter between artistic or art historical practice and the forces of the natural world, as well as the um, placement of such encounters in both contemporary and um, historical perspectives. Um, and as much as this or something akin was the intention, it put me in mind of Keith Moxie's analysis of the encounter um, in his book, Visual Time from um, 2013, um, and the slightly stricter limits of the terms much older relatives, um, the Latin words um, in contra, meaning uh, in front of or contra, against both of which define an encounter fundamentally, as you might imagine, by a sense of two or more parties um, coming together. Uh, and this, of course, is to stress human um, proximity uh, to an object, or in this case, um, a building, uh, that presence and um, engagement are key, that bodies might matter uh, as much to the analysis, um, potentially, as buildings. And this, is, this isn't just an opportunistic, possibly even anachronistic gloss for the medieval world, but something we know uh, from the broad dissemination of Aristotelian texts and ideas in particular, uh, to have been widely understood in, in medieval Europe, at least, at least from the late um, 12th uh, century. Um, aesthetic experience, interpretation, knowledge, belief, uh, all were not only um, felt uh, as well as rationalized simultaneously. It's something we know about humans today, of course, from um, studies of mind and uh, physiology, but very obviously played on and with um, in the medieval world too by uh, conscious arts and um, architectural uh, decisions. Um, now, in terms of the visual zeitgeist surrounding uh, the northeast of um, uh, late 11th and early 12th century England, uh, for want of a better phrase, this already um, poses something of a challenge because not only have historians of the uh, period suffered more than most from a um, fragmentary um, and or uh, compromised uh, architectural record, we've also been left to deal uh, with a matching paucity of written um, sources, uh, not least those relating to um, architectural uh, ekphrasis, uh, how a building like Durham might have um, impressed, persuaded, delighted, uh, intimidated, frightened, even uh, annoyed. Um, and while this isn't to apologize um, per se, it's more to make a point of omitting a certain sympathy for what is sometimes called the um, hermeneutics of um, suspicion or what Rita Felsky uh, once famously called the less visible and sometimes um, less flattering realities of literary uh, construction. You will, I hope, get a better sense of all of this uh, when we turn to our poem. Um, but for now, we will just take a closer look at the cathedral. Um, as this image can, will show, uh, despite being squeezed uh, somewhat precariously between a quiff, uh, a quiff, a cliff, uh, above, uh, above the River Weir to its west and an abrupt land slope to the east, uh, the cathedral complex at Durham was built um, almost to the largest dimensions its site would uh, permit, uh, with walls exceeding uh, sometimes three meters in thickness and a final length of more than 400 feet. It can actually be counted among the largest and most um, ambitious structures, not only of its generation, but almost of any following the decline of the Roman Empire. Uh, between the late 4th and early 12th centuries, in fact, only uh, three buildings in the entirety uh, of Western Christendom could rival uh, the size of um, old St. Peter's in Rome, uh, whereas in England, ground was actually broken uh, on nine uh, such giants, including Durham, in less than a generation um, after 1066. Um, and so this then is, is, is at least one measure of the um, profound uh, visual impact and transformation uh, brought about by uh, events in late 11th and early 12th century England, um, an unprecedented and almost um, military industrial uh, mode uh, of construction. Uh, like many of its um, southern counterparts, Durham will have spoken uh, unashamedly um, in the voice of uh, dominance, expanding, eclipsing, coercing, uh, and thereby um, conquering. And yet, uh, despite having the plan, um, the uh, massive proportions and the elevation of a more or less classic uh, Norman cathedral, uh, Durham's interior fabric uh, was also exhaustively dressed um, in a curious and to that point um, in time exceedingly um, precocious kind of um, carved veneer. Um, there was possibly scarcely any surface from the vaults to the arcading uh, to the piers that was not um, extravagantly embellished in some way, uh, whether by chisel or by brush. Uh, an interest in uh, bold linear imagery abounded, chevrons, zigzags, 
lozenges and spirals, many of which um, you can see here. In fact, by almost every standard, um, not only of um, design, but of execution, the proficiency of jointing and angling, the um, consistency of slab dimensions, uh, as well as the sheer finesse and precocity uh, of its ornamentation. Uh, the Mason's work at Durham, uh, to paraphrase um, Eric Fernie, one of the uh, great uh, authorities on the subject, must have looked as if it belonged in uh, a different age. Which age, uh, precisely, however, has long been a matter uh, for debate. Numerous prototypes uh, among the relatively um, sparse and um, scattered remnants of uh, pre-conquest architecture have been uh, proposed. Uh, the small parishes of Wittering, Stowe, Great Paxton, uh, St. Wiston's, uh, St. Bottles, and the nearby Abbey of St. Mary's um, at York. And I hesitate to um, neglect them uh, here, uh, but in the interest of brevity, it will um, suffice, I hope, to say that there is still something like a broad, um, if sometimes um, quiet, consensus that very few, uh, if any of these connections, can be thought to be um, definitive and certainly not singular uh, influences on um, Durham's plan or execution. Um, in any event, this type of question may only go so far, I would submit, uh, in terms of um, my, uh, our uh, primary interests here, how these carvings actually um, functioned, how they spoke, how they were um, encountered in practice and um, in situ. And so in pursuit of these um, admittedly um, large and um, challengingly elusive ends, we can actually turn to the work now of uh, an anonymous poet, in all likelihood, uh, a monk uh, living and um, working uh, on site, uh, precisely at the time of the um, cathedral's uh, construction. Um, writing in or around the year 1104, um, that's to say the year of the um, translatio of St Cuthbert's body um, into Durham uh, and its first East End, uh, the old English poem De Situ Denelmi blended um, space and uh, nostalgia uh, with an abundance of natural forces. Uh, the city is famous throughout the Kingdom of Britain, built on high, the rocks around it wondrously grown up. The weir runs round it, a stream strong in waves, and within it dwell many kinds of fish in the thronging of the waters. And there has grown up a great woodland enclosure, dwelling in the place on many wild beasts, in the deep dales, beasts without number. And with these first um, eight of uh, the 21 relatively brief lines, our, our, our poet monk brings a lush and um, plentiful image of Durham into view. It's unclear whether the um, famous uh, Oceani uh, Insula, the island in the Atlantic Ocean that Bede first described in his uh, De Situ Britanniae as being, quote, um, remarkable for its rivers abounding in fish, salmon, eels, and plentiful springs, um, is being consciously evoked here. It does seem um, likely. Um, in any case, not only is the um, situ here, if you like, um, inseparable uh, from the city, our author seems um, very obviously to be investing uh, in the poem right away with a series of um, strong visual connections uh, to the northern landscapes of the past. The uh, natural protection afforded to the cathedral through its combination of um, rocks, water, uh, the great woodland enclosure was essential throughout its um, early medieval years, of course, not least when a, a much less powerful pre-Norman community had to deal with the uh, repeated threats of um, Scandinavians and uh, to no lesser degree uh, the Scots, uh, but the specific and persistent praise um, of the landscape here was also very probably indicative of some of the long um, literary traditions associated with um, Cuthbert's own uh, Hiberno-Saxon heritage. In early medieval Northumbria, southern Scotland and certain uh, parts of Eastern Ireland, um, for instance, it was more than customary for new uh, monastic uh, foundations to seek uh, remote locations like this, but also um, specifically wooded ones too. Uh, St. Patrick, one of uh, Cuthbert's primary uh, missionary ancestors, founded his great church in the wood of Fockloth. Uh, the hermit Marban uh, lived alone in his cleat uh, or bothy uh, in the wood. Guthlack, also known as um, Guthlack of Crowland, took to the land of the Fens and, um, as the Exeter book describes it, a um, remote island in a wood uh, revealed to him by God. Uh, St. Deglan built a secluded cell for himself next to the sea with, quote, uh, trees close about it. And even as late as the 12th century, uh, Geoffrey of Burton recorded in his um, Life and Miracles of St. Modwina that the saint has sought out uh, a secluded hermitage for herself 
specifically on an island in the River Trent, a place she, quote, loved because at the time it was a complete wilderness full of woods, wild animals and um, desolate solitude. Now, the extent to which Desitia Donelmi also brings to mind not just Durham's um, uh, Ver Verger Mellows, as, as Nicholas Pevsner uh, once described them, but it's um, thronging waters, it's, it's, it's many kinds of fish and it's beasts uh, without number, is actually uh, an unusual marriage with the natural environment uh, too. A number of um, recent studies in eco-criticism have unpacked uh, the ways by which uh, many medieval sources made a habit of um, masking uh, the relationship and um, cooperative uh, potentials of human and non-human uh, environments. This was done either by um, mitigating descriptions of the landscape through the use of um, topoi or otherwise mundane and uh, formulaic prose, or more commonly by emphasizing the essential otherness um, and danger uh, of animality uh, beyond civilized borders. By contrast, our, our poet here uh, seems not only to actively court, but to eulogize the natural and perhaps even um, numinous phenomena of the cathedral's um, surroundings. Um, in the second half of the poem, we can note another kind of abundance too, uh, the uncounted um, relics of Durham's most revered historical figures. At the heart of the uh, descriptions is at the heart of the new uh, cathedral sat the physical remains of Durham's most um, renowned holy characters, Cuthbert, the uh, gracious and most blessed, flanks an extraordinary uh, cast, including Oswald, Aidan and Bede, many of whom also resided um, quite literally uh, within the saint's embrace inside his tomb. Um, thus, you know, a repeated interest in um, containment uh, seems to emerge. Um, successively, uh, the Kingdom of Britain as a whole, uh, the uh, River Weir, uh, the great woodland um, enclosure, the cathedral itself, Cuthbert, and then finally Durham's relic collection. And it is that special relation and play between sight uh, and frame that interests uh, me most. Um, and um, physical vistas, but in this instance, each successive space can be thought of as a kind of um, socio-cultural construct um, from nation to region uh, to city to saint, an ever um, reducing, um, ever richer distillation of a, of a felt place and building is um, brought together. So Durham Cathedral, this is to say, um, is encountered by contemporary eyes as being um, inextricably tied to the um, natural spaces that surround it. It seems to have the um, uncanny potential to borrow from um, Yohani Palasma to revive the poetic dimensions already present in um, a natural place. Indeed, our anonymous poet was um, far, from the, far from the only uh, medieval source to single these um, natural spaces out for um, special appraisal. Writing um, not much later on the subject of Durham's foundation, another monk uh, in residence, uh, Simeon, was at repeated pains to stress in his libellus just how um, remote and uninhabitable the first multitude who stumbled upon uh, the peninsula uh, found it to be in the year 995. And although Simeon would not, of course, um, have known it, Durham actually can boast a record of human archaeology that stretches back nearly four millennia. And yet he repeatedly makes the claim to the effect that the landscape was wild, um, unkempt and, quote, covered on all sides by very dense forest. Um, Simeon here then was likely providing a um, calculated and propitious analogue, not just um, to the panoply of um, saints retreating to the wilderness I listed earlier, but to Bede's 8th century descriptions uh, of Cuthbert's own ever more extreme withdrawals into the wild during his lifetime. Echoing the latter's description of the islands of Farn uh, being, quote, uh, ill-suited for human habitation, Simeon recounted at length how this first multitude at Durham, marshalled um, by their bishop, Eildon, found their own island to be, quote, not easily habitable. Uh, that is, until with the help of uh, all the people of St Cuthbert, who, quote, cut down, uprooted, uh, ploughed and sowed, until at last they had built it, uh, the now famous, quote, first little church made from branches. And so Durham's earliest community was being portrayed uh, in the self-same image of intense labour and humility uh, with which Cuthbert was associated in his lifetime and from which the um, special space and natural um, topography of the site at Durham in turn uh, became inseparable. 
Uh, another history of Simeon's um, origins and progress of this church might have described a region beset by recurrent trauma uh, and upheaval, uh, by repeated Viking invasions, by conquest, by the near um, genocidal harrying of uh, the North, and most recently by the sudden and somewhat radical dismissal uh, of the ancient community of lay clerks at Durham uh, in only 1083. Uh, to the contrary, however, both Simeon and um, our anonymous poets were clearly making the case for something like um, stability and continuity. Uh, Simeon in particular offers an almost seamless um, teleological narrative within which uh, the rule of the new Norman elite uh, is merely the logical restoration of a kind of um, natural order. Now, by way of conclusion and, and, and sort of tying this all uh, together, uh, my essential contention here, and I will um, uh, brace you all, uh, if I may, uh, uh, insofar as it necessarily entails um, an aspect of um, uh, speculation, uh, albeit I, I had hoped not without um, good reason, um, is that the, um, the decorative schema of this new Norman cathedral uh, perhaps ought to be thought of um, in an early post-conquest world um, as complicit to some degree in much the same um, messaging operation. Um, put another way, were these bold um, linear carvings more than simply decorative? Did these strange yet almost familiar forms um, speak in the same protracted rhetoric of reconciliation and um, revivalism as Simeon's libellus? Were they too perhaps um, a pawn in the same um, traumatic and um, contrived renegotiation of the past with the present? Many of the most popular decorative motifs to survive from 7th and 8th century uh, Northumbria, the years during and immediately after um, Cuthbert's lifetime, feature uh, masses of interlaced foliate uh, patterns, the carpet page um, opening the Gospel of St. Matthew uh, in the late seventh century Lindisfarne Gospels is a classic and um, exce exceptional example, as is the um, St. Cuthbert Gospel um, itself, unexpectedly found, or so the story um, goes, when Cuthbert's coffin was reopened at Durham uh, precisely in the year um, 1104. Uh, and in the bold plastic articulation of the raised interlace um, on its uh, upper cover and uh, upper cover, and especially uh, in the schematic square settings of its lower cover, it is easy, I think, to get a sense of a shared tradition. This type of insular craftsmanship was renowned above all else um, for its rejection of human form and the concentration in particular uh, on the interaction of line, pattern and surface texture, something that the masons at Durham uh, were clearly quite familiar and um, enamoured with. Uh, contemporary with all of these old images, moreover, was the spread in northern England of so-called um, hogback tombs. Uh, it's been argued that these structures were indicative of um, genuine 10th century timbered lordly halls, complete with um, bowed sides and wooden shingles. Charles Kelsey has written actually that, um, quote, the carved oval shapes represent little wooden tiles, the interlaced lines, wattles or osiers, which is to say um, sticks, uh, from which uh, structures like, for instance, Cuthbert's first little church made from branches um, may have been made. Finishing up now, um, hidden in plain sight then were several of um, Durham's more um, unusual uh, masonry forms, its many chevrons, zigzags and lozenges, actually once designed to evoke a much older um, Hiberno-Saxon tradition within which um, hewn, thatched or timbered churches were not so much outdated alternatives uh, to stone, but um, pronounced statements in their own right of um, core insular identity. Actually, I don't want to finish by implying so much that to any given um, medieval Northumbrian wood or the illusion of wood may have been preferable to stone or vice versa. Either would be, I think, uh, an all too sweeping conclusion and exceptions to both in any event uh, could be easily found. Nor am I especially interested in floating uh, any of these images necessarily as a definitive prototype. The point is broader and in part marries with one that Lisa Riley made in her emergence of um, Anglo-Norman architecture article as long ago as 1997. Um, I see the work of nostalgia here, um, a somewhat um, paradoxical process which um, simultaneously forged connections with an often um, fictitious past in order in some way uh, to supplement the present, um, simply on account of the fact then um, that perhaps then as now they couldn't have been fully or faithfully restored, maybe even in some sense because they never really existed at all. The, the scattered remnants of the pre-conquest past um, may have been the ultimate enablers of an attitude um, generated at the nexus of art and artifice. 
In 12th century Durham, the nostalgic architectural impulse thus I think has to be seen um, and understood dialectically in relation to history. It is an affective uh, rather than mnemonic mode of thinking and feeling. Um, it is driven by emotion as opposed to pure memory. Thus it is not so much the little literal materiality of a building um, like Durham, uh, the specificity of its forms or even its likely prototypes that really mattered, but the way those who encountered the cathedral um, were made to feel. Um, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ewan. That was, that was wonderful. So evocative and uh, beautifully delivered and, and so thoughtful. Um, uh, we've got, um, uh, I've got at least one question here. Um, it's funny, I was listening to your paper and, and I was actually reminded by, by um, you know, Count Orsino in the Forest of Arden. <laughs> Mm. Tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, and sermons in stones. Uh, and it is remarkable about Durham, and, and you know, we take it for granted, and many of us just pass it on the train, but it is this extraordinary way it's, it's enclosed in this almost like forest setting. I think you said that off beautifully. I'd like to thank both of you. We've got some time for questions. I do actually have one on the screen here, which, if, if I may read this out, it's um, that's a written question, and it's from an anonymous attendee from, from Durham. Hello from Durham. Uh, and the questioner uh, says, in, in Durham Cathedral, there are several columns surrounding the Shrine of St. Cuthbert that are fossil filled, similar to the roach stone that Freya discussed. The columns are not Norman, I don't think, but nonetheless, I wonder if this is a way that Ewan and Freya's papers might speak to one another. Apologies if this isn't really a question, but if either Ewan or Freya have any comments, I'd be fascinated. So stones with fossils. Well, I can start by saying that um... The, the anonymous uh, uh, person in question, uh, he or she and I uh, are perhaps kindred spirits because that's actually exactly the note I made, I made while Freya was um, uh, speaking. Those columns, are, it's local frostily marble, I think, if, um, if we're thinking of the same uh, thing. There is also some black limestone um, in Durham, which um, I actually looked this up in advance, has some fossil corals from, and um, you'll have to excuse the pronunciation here, from the Carboniferous period, I think, if that's correct, Freya, you might um, weigh in on that. Um, but yes, that, that's it's certainly uh, one of the more immediate connections between the two papers. Thank you, Freya. Do you have any any comment on that at all? Um, no, um, I'm I'm not a geologist expert. Not, not not that you should. Can I ask a question? I uh, if, about uh, Roach, and because uh, you know it's. It's a, it's a, it's from Portland, isn't it? So it's an English it's an English stone. And I, I, we're used to was was that did that play any um, part in it? The fact that it was relatively local, as opposed to using travertine, which is also a, you know a stone that's well Roman stone that's used. It does have fossils in it and does have that strange that wonderful kind of texture. So yeah, I mean it's very similar to to travertine. Um, some of the replacements that got made in 1990, they replaced Roach for travertine inside the building, not outside. Um, it's the history of why the Smithsons chose it is not clear. I, I think I've exhausted all avenues, but uh, but the, the thing I have that does get said by the assistants is that they, the Smithsons came across it on trips to Portland. They saw it. Um, I don't know if that gives it any kind of aspirations to nationalism, um, but, but it's, it was a local stone. I also looked into whether they had seen if there was a history behind uses of travertine, if they'd seen something like Eugenie Moretti's buildings in Rome, and if that had had any effect on not necessarily why they used Portland stone, but how they detailed it. But I never came up with anything. Mm. Um, they, they, they were, there was a broad interest in materials. I think they liked it because of its novelty. And as, I, as I've suggested, um, because of how it looked, these, these marks, it might have been cheaper than travertine. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Interesting when you were talking, Freya, because I was thinking about, um... I uh, often associate the Economist building with Upper Lawn Pavilion, mm. Lesson's house uh, in Wiltshire, that they worked on obviously at roughly the same time. And at uh, Font Hill, uh, as I'm sure you know, there's, um, they chose Font Hill because of the ruined Font Hill Abbey and the picturesque landscape there with grottos and other forms. 
And it's also very easy to get from uh, Fonthill down to the sort of Jar Jurassic coastline and where Portland is. Yeah. So I, I'm sure it was, I'm sure there was a local association, but I think that I would guess because of their fascination with the picturesque, that was also one of the reasons for choosing the stone. But the, it, it's again, it's not, the, the fun of talking about the building is things aren't clear from what the Smithsons say, so you, you're free to speculate. I'm not, the problem with the picturesque reading is, is the argument they liked it because it was honest. You could see how it got made and, and how they detailed it. Um, I didn't talk about this in the talk, but they did something called a Brechtian trick. Peter Smithson left two inches off the bottom of every column so that you could see that structurally the building was made, of, it was built of concrete, not of roach. And those all undercut any sense of illusion or image that you get from the picturesque. So you, it's, it's a kind of yes and no, I always find, but that's, that's what's fun about it. Although I know Rainer Bannum saw it very as very significant that they have, um, chose Gordon Cullen to depict the Economist building. Yeah, and yeah. Bannum thought that the, the, this indicated their collapse into the picturesque, which of course for him was a really negative uh, change in their work. And that, that it was a classical building, he said, yeah. yeah. Got a couple of more questions up here before we move on. Um, First is from, I've uh, got here a written question from Adam Coleman, question for Freya. Is it possible to talk about the Smithsons' use of roach in relation to other materials used in other schemes during this period? Were these concerns being expressed elsewhere in their practice or is it distinct? Yeah, I asked someone about this last week. The only thing I've ever come up with that's within this, not even me, someone suggested that maybe it could be likened to St Hilda's um, timber cladding, the, the framework around it. Um, I, I think it's distinct, partly because I would always make an argument for it that it's not just a material, it's, 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 it's ornament, at least as they use it on, on The Economist. So that separates it slightly from other things. Okay. Other people using it? No. I know a few buildings that started using roach portland stone pretty quickly after the Smithsons did it. Um, there's a building in Edinburgh that started using it in the late 1960s, um, quite a lot of buildings since in the UK, but this is the first, The Economist. Okay, um, thank you. There's a couple of other things, we've got to move on in a moment. Um, I've got a question or observation by Romy Romweather here, and it says, uh, Freya, as far as the costs go for the 1960s, what, have may, what may have been saved by using roach cladding other than Tradition rather than traditional cladding. So, oh, I've been asked this before and I've tried to find <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah, I've tried to find this out. I'd really like to know. Because um, one argument is that it might be cheaper because it's the higher bed, then whip bed is, a, a, is, the, is the bed directly below, so you have to quarry less far down. Um, mm -hmm. But then it might be more expensive because it could have been harder to work and a lot of stone cost comes in the process, the processing of the material. I don't know. I have emailed and I have rung uh, Portland Bill Quarry and I just haven't found that out, but I'm, I'm going to keep trying. Okay. I don't know the answer to that one yet. Um, got one more, maybe just fit this one. This is from um, Emily Smith to all panellists. Question for Ewan. Wondering if the patterns could be making reference, we were talking about Durham obviously, the, the patterns could be making reference to natural question mark Celtic patterns, especially as you mentioned the link between religious buildings and being in areas close to trees? It's a good question. Um, and I, I, I hesitate to unpack it a little bit. Um, but the term Celtic, of course, is, is ever so slightly problematic. Um, there weren't really, as far as we know, a, a definitive set of people with a de definitive or recognisable or reproducible visual culture that refer to themselves as the Celts. But I'll, I'll take it as a, as a Sort of given that I um, know the point that she's driving towards. I, I think certainly in respect of, if, if you like, a kind of Irish Christianity um, in England, particularly in the North, um, that was different and separate and arrived differently and separately um, than uh, the Augustinian mission did in 597. In the South, yes, I, I think it must be bound up within that kind of tradition to a greater um, or lesser extent. Okay. Lovely, thank you. We'll move on. I, I, I'm, I'm going to satisfy you here. I'm not going to sing the school song, but I'm going to give you the words which I can remember, sadly. Uh, 
By the banks of silvery weir, need Prath Dunelm's towered shrine, rests the body of our patron, hard by Beda, sage divine. Yet his spirit still bides with us, all undimmed his virtues shine, in the walls of old St Cuthbert's, in the old school by the time. Of course, our school was in Newcastle, by the time, not by the weir, but we had to make it rhyme. So there we are. Uh, with that, uh, I will move on. <laughs> Okay. Thank you both so much. We'll, I'm sure there'll be a few more questions before we move on. But I'm going to move on now to Alicia Weisberg Roberts, who's giving the third uh, paper. And uh, Alicia, we're going to move uh, out of uh, England and we're going to move to uh, terraforming Hong Kong. Uh, Alicia uh, has uh, had a, a distinguished career working at the VNA, the, uh, the Yale Centre for British Art, and the Walters. Uh, and also at the University in Hong Kong. And she's an expert on all sorts of things, 18th century and, and beyond. Mrs. Delaney, which I'm familiar with, Horace Walpole, and uh, various other things. But she's going to talk about something rather different today. So I think with it just turning one o'clock, I could turn over now to you, uh, Alicia, to uh, talk us through transforming or terraforming Hong Kong, 1840 to 1860. Well, thank you very much, Martin. I'm going to try to do this smoothly. <laughs> As we all do. <laughs> Let's see. Ah, okay. Um, and this is uh, now terraforming Hong Kong in the 1840s. So fulsome apologies to anyone who has turned up for 1857. We're not going to get there. Um, so Discussions of climate appear in virtually all of the genres of writing produced about Hong Kong in the first half of the 19th century. Whether records of naval voyages, newspapers and gazetteers, ethnographic works, travelogues, personal journals, or even poetry. And let's see if we can advance. Here. Okay. Here we are. Um, Given that much of this material was either generated by or sought to inform maritime trade, this could seem overdetermined. But in this period, the idea of climate was being used to interrogate much more than the prevailing weather conditions. At the point when Hong Kong became a British possession, the concept of climate and Britain's imperial project were closely intertwined. As many scholars have argued, the accumulation of empirical data about the natural world was both the result and a technology of imperialism. Following Alexander von Humboldt's elucidation of climate as a global phenomenon, a belief in ecological malleability deeply penetrated British scientific networks of formal and informal empire. Among other far-reaching consequences, this led to an understanding of climate as not only a latitudinal phenomenon, but also a matter of terrain elevation, exposure, geology, and hydrology. In fact, Hong Kong was the subject of the first contour map published by the Ordnance Office, predating any other British territory. Simultaneously, a much older model of climatic determinism and moral ethnography persisted, derived from Aristotelian and Hippocratic precepts via Montesquieu, it continued to underpin attitudes and decision-making in military policy, diplomacy, and in public health and safety. Thus, at the moment of Hong Kong's foundation, we see a confluence of three ways of looking at climate, as an accumulation of data collected over time, as a function of geography and topography, and as a physiological and moral influence. This paper will explore the ways climatic theory shaped the built environment of Victoria, as the settlement on Hong Kong Island, on the North Shore of Hong Kong Island was initially known, and how this informed its representations. From the 1840s onwards, narratives about Hong Kong repeatedly emphasize its inhospitable character, the better to describe a miraculous arc from barren rock to model imperial city. This characterization has lately been challenged by scholars, either writing from the viewpoint of environmental history seeking to or seeking to challenge colonial teleologies, or both. It is certainly worth remembering that the very earliest Western reports of the island are of the availability of fresh water and the navigability of its natural harbor. However, the development of Victoria was repeatedly interrupted and redirected by outbreaks of disease, piracy, and catastrophic typhoons, all linked to the idea of malign climate in the contemporary imaginaire. The British seizure of Hong Kong had been accomplished with violence and at great expense, 
and the vicissitudes attending its construction imposed further expenditure of both lives and funds. These investments were justified, in British eyes at least, by the vastly ambitious but hitherto elusive goal of opening China fully to European trade. In order to justify the costs and fulfill the hopes that attended its establishment, Hong Kong needed, at a bare minimum, to be able to support a permanent year-round trading settlement. The territory had to be rendered habitable for colonial subjects and also had to be seen to be habitable. I should say at the outset that many aspects of the imperial enterprise in China were predicated on the much longer colonial experience in India and not only on the level of official policy. Many of the, art of the agents of informal empire in Hong Kong, merchants, police, journalists, engineers, missionaries, artists, had cut their teeth on the subcontinent and others would continue their careers there after leaving the China coast. Many were born in Guangzhou, Bombay, Baghdad, and Glasgow, and would never and would live and die without ever setting foot in London. The colonial development of Hong Kong can thus be seen as integral to that of Sri Lanka and the Antipodes. The built environment of the Strait settlements illustrates closer dialogue still. As civic, commercial, and military interests scrambled for strategic advantage, they proposed and deployed interventions drawn from a latitudinal section of imperial possessions including building types from Penang, Madras, and Kingston, Jamaica. I will not have time in this paper to do more than allude to some of these connections, but I want to mention this here as it is important both for understanding the material I am presenting today and to my larger project. Historians of the British Empire have long questioned and sought to move beyond a center periphery model for understanding colonial interactions. Various analytical models, including Wallerstein's world system and Latour's centers of calculation, have appeared successively and suggested different and productive ways of, of connecting sites of empire. In this paper and in my project more broadly, my approach is to frame the British Empire as multinodal, weekly a weekly centralized system in which operations and information linked the metropole and its far-flung dominions, but often did so indirectly while agents in these peripheral nodes often interacted through networks that might on only incidentally uh, connect through the center. Today, I'm going to look at three sets of images produced between 1844 and 1846. This was a watershed moment in the representation of the territory when the depiction of Hong Kong broke out of a long tradition of depicting China through the very limited and liminal spaces available to European observers. While this differentiation can be seen as a consequence of the British possession of the territory, it is important to note that it begins before that outcome was assured. And while a number of other possibilities were in play. As has frequently been related, Charles Eliot's choice of Hong Kong as a treaty port was regarded as eccentric and his personal political fortunes were irrevocably diminished by it. Other interests on the China coast and politicians in London would have preferred uh, the island of Shusan, modern day Shusan, um, which was captured twice during the First Opium War, but restored to China in the Treaty of Nanking. The latter was larger than Hong Kong Island and convenient to the mouth of the Yangtze with its tantalizing promise of trade with the Chinese interior. Despite its advantageous trading position, climate rendered Shusan unsuitable for permanent occupation. Troops garrisoning the island were repeatedly swept by rising waves of sickness, making holding the island unexpectedly costly. Hong Kong too would suffer pestilence repeatedly from the Hong Kong fevers of 1843 and 1846 to the great plague of 1894. But by then it was already a British possession and its climate would have to be ameliorated rather than summarily abandoned. Christopher Cowell has written extensively about the impact of disease on the building of Hong Kong and has made a strong case for thinking of attempts to thwart sickness and improve public health as key factors in shaping the city. And this is a, I think empire and disease is going to be a topic later on in this conference. Um, by 1844, Hong Kong was in the midst of its third wave of building. The precessionary tents of the Kowloon encampment having given way to mat shed structures which were being replaced in turn by stone, brick, and timber edifices. 
This building boom was set in motion well before the territory's political future was assured. Nearly a year before the Treaty of Nanking, on the 14th of June, 1841, an auction of prime lots was held with the stipulation that buyers would have to build to a minimum value, a minimum appraised value of a thousand pounds on each lot within six months of sale. In addition to the naval and ordnance mapping campaigns that had already been initiated, the auction provided an important context for the early cartography of Victoria. Featuring price fixing, insider trading, and various informal methods of conveyancing, disputes around the first land auction would be a feature of legal life in the colony for decades to come. The island's topography, which included little flat land and drastic changes in elevation, drove intense and continuing competition for salutary sites. During the four years of frenetic development that followed, a number of trading firms that had operated principally out of Canton and Macau joined Jardine and Matheson and the British Superintendency of Trade in relocating their headquarters to Hong Kong. They sought maritime, they sought marine lots for their go-downs and secure healthful sites for their houses. After the abandonment of the malarial expanse of Happy Valley in 1843, these building projects were concentrated in two areas, the central district around the newly laid out Queens Road and Spring Gardens, sometimes also referred to as East Point. Leaving aside views of the island as a whole, these areas provide the principal subjects of most views of Hong Kong in the 1840s. Among those who sought their fortune during this initial building boom was the young Devonshire architect, Edward Ashworth, who arrived in Hong Kong by way of New Zealand and Australia. Ashworth, who sketched and kept journals throughout his voyage, provides us with some of the earliest street views of the city. After Ashworth's return to England in 1846, the observations he made in Hong Kong and Macau formed the original portions of his entry on Chinese architecture, published in 1851 as a detached essay for the Encyclopedia of Architecture issued by the Architectural Publication Society. In this text, we can see some of the ways in which climate was shaping the built environment. Despite the essay's title, Ashworth was unable to personally observe any Chinese architecture outside of Macau the Canton factories and Hong Kong. And he was aware that what he was seeing was already hybrid or in his words, very barbarous, seeming to caricature the works of Christopher Wren and Inigo Jones. In an attempt to identify and isolate Chinese architecture within the melange of styles that he recognized in Victoria, Ashworth devoted a large proportion of his illustrations to the house of the Hong merchant Chinam, which he described as the only good Chinese mansion existing in Hong Kong in, 19, in 1845, when the picturesque screen was pulled down to give place to three shop frontages. In both his visual and textual portrayal of this building, he play, paid particular attention to the lattices, screening walls, and parapets that promoted and controlled airflow and access to the interior. In the interval between the First and Second Opium Wars, trade increased in Hong Kong, followed by the other treaty ports, and the relative importance of Canton was reduced. Concomitantly, the English presence in Macau diminished. In early 1846, either at the behest of his relocating patrons or in search of fresh ones, George Chinnery, at the age of 72, made his sole voyage to Hong Kong. In a letter written to Captain Daguilar in 1848, Chinnery wrote that he had spent only six, month, six months there only, all the time so very unwell, not to say ill, that I had the power of doing but very little. Nonetheless, he could claim to have produced 15 views of Hong Kong, large and full of detail, none of which could be sold to Daguilar as they had been bespoken by particular parties whose names were written again, I'm quoting Chinnery here, in their own handwriting on the several pages of their respective sketches. Sadly, none of Chinnery's currently known drawings of Hong Kong seem to correspond with the 15 referred to in his communique, although they do fit within what we know of his drawing practices more generally. Chinnery sketched daily, worked up compositions from various studies, kept a stock of fair copies on hand, 
and produced collections of sketches as well as finished compositions to order. As an ensemble, they also give us a fair idea of who the particular parties mentioned in Chinnery's letter might have been. Some show the site developed by Jardine and Matheson at Spring Garden. Others focus on the premises of their commercial rivals, Dent and Company. Um, Chinnery sketched both locations and uh, Dent, the Dent and Company go down is here. Um, if that is indicating something. Um, Chinnery sketched both locations from nearby heights and from boats offshore, utilizing compositional strategies, uh, which had become a trademark of his views of the Praia and Inner Harbor of Macau. He provides a more intimate view of the Denton Company residences at Greenbank. We know that during his time in Hong Kong, Chinnery stayed in the smaller of the two houses on the property. This happened to be the earliest permanent European dwelling on Hong Kong Island. It had originally been erected by William Kane, the chief magistrate, on the slope below the fortified magistracy compound in 1841. Kane, a veteran of numerous Indian campaigns, used local Chinese craftsmen and materials to build a single story house with deep verandas on three sides, a bungalow in other words, albeit one topped with a chinoiserie roof. Wilkinson Dent, who acquired the bungalow from Kane along with the rest of the property, used it as a residence and a place for entertaining guests. A few yards northwest of the bungalow, George T. Brain, a partner in Dent and Company, constructed a two-story flat-roofed house uh, in the classicizing style that was rapidly becoming typical of Victoria. George Brain had arrived in Macau via India in 1838. As he told the Parliamentary Select Committee in 1847, he was placed in special charge of Denton Company's opium trade. He would later be succeeded at Denton Company and at Greenbank by his brother, Charles Joseph. Opium was not the brain's only botanical interest. From 1843, Greenbank served as the Southern Chinese base for the botanist and plantsman, Robert Fortune. Fortune had been sent by the Horticultural Society of London to collect seeds and plants of an ornamental or useful kind and not already cultivated in Great Britain and to obtain information upon Chinese gardening and agriculture together with the nature of its climate and apparent influence on vegetation. Denton Company provided Fortune with letters of credit, accommodation and access to their gardens in Macau and Hong Kong and eventually also in Shanghai. Uh, Fortune's intention uh, was to use uh, Greenbank as a place to test and promote his recommendations for the afforestation of the island. Specimens he planted there included painted bamboo, the Indian neem, and the Chinese banyan, uh, the Chinese banyan and the Chinese pine, and correspond closely with those that he later advised Governor John Davis to plant in order to ameliorate the hostile climate of Hong Kong. The bamboos and, and arborescent species which Chinnery would have encountered in the garden at Greenbank would subsequently be widely planted in the hopes of providing cooling shade and vitiating the miasmas, which were still widely believed to cause malaria. There is a great deal of overlap between Chinnery's drawings and the most widely circulated views produced in this period. The set of lithographs drawn by the architect, overseer, of Rhodes and superintendent of convict labor, Murdoch Bruce. This is not surprising given how close in time they were produced, a matter of months, and the high likelihood that the two men would have encountered each other during Chinnery's sojourn on the island. Bruce was a shaper, portrayer, and ultimately a victim of the climate of the South China coast. In the summer of 1846, his print series was promoted in the pages of the Hong Kong Register. The series of 12 views that were duly published by the London, Liverpool, and Glasgow-based lithographers, McClure, MacDonald, and McGregor, are the most comprehensive and most frequently reproduced images of early Hong Kong. Showing title page. Um, and they are, however, very little studied in their own right. Um, in an article that forms an honorable exception 
the architectural historian Alex Bremner, points out that, many that in many respects, the views reflect commonplace and normative picturesque conventions while presenting an idealized, but also racially stratified picture of colonial society. Um, this is certainly important for interpreting much about the ways in which the views are populated. However, I would argue that it misses a core theme of the series, one which both closely concerns the topic of climate and which Murdoch Bruce can be seen to have doubly authored, the roads themselves. Bruce's images foreground building, digging, and grading, placing particular emphasis on the work that he would have overseen. As in Chinnery's view of Green Bank, this is often accomplished by inserting laboring figures into the scene, as we see in the foreground here. In the middle of this image, we can also see a building being erected within a bamboo scaffolding and being plastered as it rises in precisely the same manner as Ashworth describes in his text on Chinese architecture. Bruce's focus on the transformation of terrain is also expressed through his selection of sites and viewpoints. As one might express, expect, these encompass the first and most developed street streetscapes of Victoria and the governmental and civic landmarks that closely abutted them. But they frequently juxtapose the new edifices with the raw outcrops and granite megaliths from which the city was emerging, whether by excavation or augmentation. In 1846, when Victoria occupied only a little more than a narrow strip along the North Shore of Hong Kong, Bruce made the settlement look like a monumental undertaking worthy of the towering peaks that rose above it. Unlike Chinnery or even Ashworth, we have very little biographical information about Bruce. Other than the scattered official notices, the most substantial reference occurs in William Tarrant's retrospective memoir of 1861. Bruce is introduced in the context of the fever of 1843. Writing on the Hong Kong fever too, we are reminded of having omitted mention of a character somewhat blasé in those days, viz. Murdoch Bruce, one of the overseers of works under the land, office, under the land officer. Murdoch was knocked down by the sun and the doctor directed that he should be divested of all superfluous hair. Shave my head if you like, said the vain Highlander but I will die rather than you shall touch my whiskers." Like Ashworth, Bruce would have learned to draw as part of his architectural training, and likewise seems to have been determined to turn his skill to profit and self-advancement. The remainder of the account describes Bruce's overweening ambition and grisly colonial fate. Filled with an idea that he was made for better things, Tarrant writes, he followed Sir Henry Pottinger to Madras and tried to gain his patronage presumably wishing to advance to a higher office. Bruce may have hoped that Hong Kong Illustrated, with its emphasis on his own role in the creation of Victoria, would have done, would have done him credit in this connection. Alas, Tarrant reports that he met with a rebuff that, which drove him crazier than he was before, eventually, and eventually he died in the straits of starvation and disease. Consolingly, but also somewhat inaccurately, Terence concludes that the name of Murdoch Bruce in connection with the Book of Lithographs will be of the principal buildings in Hong Kong in 1844 will ever be remembered. Bruce's views have certainly long outlasted the, me the memory of their creator and have gone on to act as, a visual, as visual stand ins for Hong Kong's early colonial history in many contexts, especially insofar as they thematized the ways in which the construction of the city involved the literal shaping of the landscape that encompassed it they can be seen as performing a task similar to the useful myth of the barren rock, representing Hong Kong as a territory to be simultaneously seized and created. In this paper, I hope that I have been able to demonstrate that they and other early representations also encode ideas about the precarity and contingency of the imperial enterprise in relation to climatic forces. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alicia. That, that was that was lovely. Um, very, very sort of suggestive in all sorts of different ways. Um, sort of microcosm of, of, of what was going on with the empire in this one particular place. And the, we can talk more perhaps about the idea of climate and uh, how one controls, controls that, you know, to impose this structure, both technological and aesthetically. I'm going to move straight on now because it's uh, 
We're doing very well. And I'm going to move to last speaker, Jonathan Hill. Jonathan is Professor of Architecture and Visual Theory at the Barclay School, uh, where he directs the MF Field PhD Architectural Design Programme. He's, he's very well published. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have you with us today, Jonathan. And your paper is uh, entitled, I understand, Against the Anthropocene. John Evelyn and Brenda Colvin, I never thought of linking those two together, but you'll explain to us all about that now. So a very warm welcome to, to Jonathan. Okay, thank you. I'm going to mute myself now. Thanks very much for the introduction. It's very, very, it's very nice to be here. Actually, the, the title is actually The Landscape of Climate, John Evelyn and Brenda Colvin. Uh, the, the, uh, that was uh, an earlier title. Uh, so I'll just try to share my screen. So hopefully you, you see the images now. So the climate and the weather have stimulated the architectural, artistic and literary imaginations for centuries. And in 1661, John Evelyn complained that a hellish cloud of sea coal blanketed London. Evelyn's Fumifugium was the first book to consider a city's atmosphere as a whole, as well as the first to propose mitigation and adaptation as responses to anthropogenic climate change, three centuries before these principles were widely accepted. And offering what he called a remedy for the nuisance, Evelyn suggests that a number of practical uh, and poetic measures can be instigated. Coal burning trades are relocated beyond the city and the edges of London are forested with trees and planted with fragrant shrubs so that wood replaces coal as the principal fuel and the city is sweetly perfumed promoting associations with the Garden of Eden. And just three years later in 1664, the institutional home of English empiricism, the Royal Society uh, produced its first official publication. And that was Evelyn's Silver or a Discourse of Forest Trees. And marking a more sensitive attitude to the modification of nature than before, Evelyn acknowledged the effects of deforestation on climate and the need for forestry science conservation and sustainable development. And this is obviously the uh, frontispiece to Fuma Fugium. Now, e Evelyn's empiricism was one of the many catalysts to the transformation of the English landscape in the early 18th century. And the picturesque, I think, is a deceptive term because it emphasizes one aspect of that landscape to the detriment of its other qualities, such as the importance of the senses and the seasons to design, experience, understanding, and the imagination. The picturesque was productive as well as pleasurable, and the early 18th century estate was conceived holistically in social, aesthetic, agricultural, and ecological terms. And this is actually an image of William Kent's garden at Rousham in Oxfordshire, uh, which was uh, created between about 1737 and 1741. Now I'm going to sort of uh, move forward into the uh, mid 20th century uh, and during the Second World War, Kenneth Clark actually has said following the wartime bombard bombardment of London, bomb damage is picturesque. And Clark's stoic embrace of ruination was in line with a burgeoning 20th century romanticism. And in 1944, he, uh, T.S. Eliot and John Maynard Keynes uh, joined uh, together in writing a letter to the Times, in which they state that a ruined church would be an evocative monument to wartime sacrifices. As in the 18th century, the ruin was a temporal metaphor rep representing potential as well as loss, an environmental model combining nature and culture. And in a subsequent publication, which this image comes from, uh, and the, the publication has a rather direct uh, um, uh, title, which is Bombed Churches as War Memorials. And that was published in 1945. And in that book, uh, Brenda Colvin complicates, uh, uh, complements the recognition of the cultural value of a ruin with a corresponding call for an enveloping nature. And she says this, with a little imagination, one might visualize a London left to nature's healing hand hidden under a great forest of sycamore. And uh, two years later in a book for, called Trees for Town and Country, she proposes post-war uh, reforestation. And in that book, she recalls the landscape planting of earlier centuries, notes that 23 
of the 60 trees in her book originated in Britain and invokes a sylvan allegory of liberalism. This is what she says. Although introduced to Britain by human agency, the Spanish chestnut grows well on light soils and suits our landscape. It has become so well integrated that the eye accepts it as a native tree. The expansion of UK higher education in the 1960s offered the opportunity to build on this debate. And at the new Unis University of East Anglia, the focus of the campus is Elam, uh, Earlham Hall in Norfolk, which was once owned by a descendant of Francis Bacon, who was the father figure of empiricism. And uh, Earlham Hall is surrounded by an 18th century park founded, uh, bounded by the, the river uh, Yar. The new 1960s university's commitment to self-improvement was indebted to empiricism and their landscape settings reaffirmed this association. In a decade known for cultural and social experimentation, an 18th century parkland was appropriate to a new welfare state university precisely because of its association with British liberalism and uh, its reassertion in the 1940s and 50s as a token uh, of national identity. In Norfolk, such a site had special resonance because the country is known for some of England's grandest 18th century picturesque estates. Now, while 18th century uh, England advocated liberalism, only a small proportion of the population was allowed a university education, the right to vote and access to a picturesque estate. In contrast, the 20th century welfare state aimed to open these rights and pleasures to all classes. And in 1969, Kenneth Clark struck an optimistic note at the end of the concluding episode of Civilization, his seminal BBC series on Western art, architecture and philosophy. And this is what he says. I am at one of our new universities, the University of East Anglia. One mustn't under overrate the culture of what used to be called top Peter people before the wars. They had charming manners, but they were as ignorant as swans. They knew little about literature, less about music, nothing about art, and less than nothing about philosophy. The members of a music group or an art group at a provincial university today would be 10 times better for informed and more alert. The architect of the new University of East Anglia, uh, which was Dennis Lasden, uh, toured Norfolk to try to understand the context for his design. And in a blue exercise book, he noted local people and places, while his uh, wife Susan recalls that Norfolk then was such a backwater, it was like going back to the 18th century. And that's a quote from her. In a key de design decision with picturesque connotations, Lasden decided that the various architectural elements were, as he said, to be disposed on this site with, were, uh, with loving care for the configuration and contours of the landscape, its prospect and aspect. Impressed by the 18th century Hokum estate on the North Norfolk coast, he mirrored its spatial sequence, beginning with a tree-lined uh, linear avenue that runs due south until, until it reaches a nodal point that reveals panoramic, panoramic views and leads the picturesque routes across the university and towards the water. So while at Hokum, this uh, sequence actually faces north, um, Larson simply inverted it so it faces south. Proposing the full extent of the university in 15 years time, Lassen's UEA development plan of uh, 1962, which is on the screen now, has three scales. And it's very unusual for an architectural drawing in that it doesn't just have a, a building scale. It, ha it has a, a one to 1250 drawing scale. It has a walking scale of three miles an hour and a cycling scale of 10 miles an hour. In the picturesque, the eye is drawn to a monument or a natural feature but the path is not direct or singular. Even when the visitor is static, movement is implicit because any view is understood in relation to other potential views and is but one part of a complex whole. Arranged across the slope, UEA offers oblique views that associate physical movement with the strides and leaps of the imagination, as Lasden made clear. And he st stated that every moment of walking is a moment of thinking. Remarking, and this is another quote from Lasden, he said, I became interested in designing buildings which responded almost ecologically 
to unique and specific situations. And last and consequently recommended Brenda Colvin as UEA's landscape architect. Uh, Colvin's a very interesting figure because she was president of the Institute of Landscape Architects in 1951 and was the first woman to head a UK design or environmental profession. And she appreciated Evelyn's advocacy of forestry science and sustainable development and asserted, asserted that the planting regimes uh, were a responsible, uh, responsibility inherited by the post-war welfare state. Maintaining and expanding the site's rich diversity of natural habitats, Colvin conceived the integration of landscape and architecture in terms of the interdependence of nature and culture, associating physical processes with metaphysical dimensions. And questioning the degree to which any landscape can be described as man-made, she wanted the UEA landscape to be a self-conserving system as far as possible. Colvin gently sculpted the rising ground so that the residential cigarettes appeared to rise directly from the land like the rocky outcrops that Lasden intended. Nearer to the university buildings, she re recommended that fine grass would be closely mown, while further away it would be of a rougher texture and left long and scythe only occasionally, contrasting a cultivated lawn to a wild meadow. And Colvin suggested that an existing chalk pit could accommodate the open air elliptical amphitheater depicted in Lasden's 1962 developmental plan. And she proposed that a further emblem of the picturesque, a viewing prospect, uh, should be sited on a newly sculpted hill immediately to the north. And to the south, uh, she proposed a wilderness uh, would include a large lake, waterlogged reed, bed, reed beds and willow plantations. This is uh, one of a rather beautiful series of uh, images that uh, Lasden actually commissioned for the UEA uh, by Richard Einzig. And, and it's a very interesting image because uh, across the marshy meadow, UEA's craggy silhouette is seen in the misty evening light of a vast Norfolk sky scattered high, uh, with high drifting clouds. And to the left, the sparse foliage of a large tree frames the view very much in the manner that Claude Lorraine would frame his subjects through left to center overhanging leaves and branches, inspiring both 18th century and 20th century advocates of the picturesque. And between the ziggurats and the tree, if you look very carefully on your screen, you might be able to see two small figures, one walking and one cycling. And this clearly is a reference to Lasden's 1962 development plan. This is actually an image of uh, one of the things that Lassen was intrigued about when he um, researched Norfolk was uh, the uh, landscape architect Humphrey Repton. And this is actually a photograph of uh, Lasden peering at, at uh, Repton's tomb. Now, one of the things that interests me about uh, the work of you of Colvin and Lasden at UEA is, um, and obviously their reference to Evelyn and to the picturesque, is that despite this long and inventive environmental history and the burgeoning ecological movement in the 1960s, anthropogenic climate change was not widely acknowledged by scientists until the mid 1970s, leading, I would argue, present day architects to often forget the past and instead deploy a debased technocratic empiricism devoid of the poetic and practical implications of Evelyn Colvin and Lasden's research. We need to simultaneously apply historical understanding to landscape design and climate research, studying their interconnected histories to better appreciate the future. Now, climate always changes, whether by anthropogenic or other means. And some critics of global warming imply that the current situation is an ideal that must be preserved and adopt religious metaphors in which environmental catastrophe is punishment for human failing, even though climate change is mostly incremental and not sudden. Ideas about climate obviously express wider societal values, including attitudes to nature, ethics, and governance. Uh, and one of the people who I, I found very interesting in this concept, uh, context is the climate research scientist, Mike Hume. And he uh, uh, observes and emphasizes, emphasizes that of course, science is itself a cultural pursuit. Now he's actually a member of um, uh, the Hartwell group of climate research scientists who include Hume, Gwyn Prince and Steve Reiner among others. And they have adopted the term wicked problem 
to conclude that climate change is so complicated, it is beyond our ability to comprehend, comprehend and solve. First defined by Horst Rittel in 1967, and then published uh, in a paper with Melvin uh, Weber in 1973, the term uh, wicked problem initially referred to planning, not climate change, which suggests that architecture is also a wicked problem. And according to Rittel and, and Weber, and this is a quote from them, social problems are never solved. At best, they are only resolved over and over again. And in a similar vein, the authors of the Hartwell paper from 2010 write that, and this is a quote from them, rather than being a discrete problem to be solved, climate change is better understood as a persistent condition that must be coped with and can only partially managed more or less well. The dangers of global warming are real and need to be addressed when and where possible, notably because their effects are unequal often causing greater harm to poorer, powerless communities. But climate change may encourage cultural, social, and environmental innovations and benefits, whether at a local or a regional scale, including great, greater appreciation of the earth and criticism of the isolationist policies of corporations and nations. And I found it intriguing that among the Hartwell authors who were all climate research scientists, one of their most common references is to the 18th century gardener Lancelot Capability Brown. And it, they use him to suggest that an oblique bleak approach may be effective in climate policy and landscape design. Now, I think they refer to Brown because obviously he's so widely known, but really I think the, uh, uh, that William Kent was a far more important development of the picturesque than Brown. And Brown was obviously an assistant to, to Kent. And their reference, how is to Kent, towards Kent, uh, and they write this. Uh, this is referring to, to uh, Brown. His advice would be to approach the object of emissions reduction by other goals, riding with other constituencies and gathering other benefits. I think this suggests that the gardener and the landscape uh, designer are rewarding models for contemporary approaches to climate change, biodiversity, and architecture because they acknowledge that we do not control nature and must work with, not against it. At a casual glance, a landscape may appear to be sub subject to human order, but no more and no more natural than any other cultural artifact. But despite the reduction of wildlife habitats and proliferation of pesticides, each landscape and each building are teeming with creatures that are subject to their own rhythms and intertwined in a complex network of relations with other life forms, including humanity. Equally, we need to remember that people are natural as well as cultural beings. The term Anthropocene is unhelpful because it is anthrop anthropocentric and the co-production of multiple authors, human, non-human and atmospheric is an appropriate model for architecture and landscape in an era of increasing climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and uh, beautifully timed, as with all the other papers, and that in interesting final thought about the validity of the term Anthropocene, which is one that is, is being used extensively now, perhaps perhaps not as thinkingly as it, as it might be. Um, okay, it's coming up to quarter to two. Um, let's divide it up and have the first questions. Uh, we've got a little bit of time left, specifically um, geared towards the last two papers from Alicia and, and Jonathan. So I'm going to look at the Q&A there, um, but I think you, you can also ask a question as well. I think that's correct. Uh, Danny and, and Ella, if, I mean, people can actually ask a question verbally. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah. So you can do that just by, by signaling that you'd like to, to speak, uh, or if you prefer not to, uh, you can pop a question in the Q&A and I will see it as it comes up. Okay, while, while we're waiting, let me ask a question. This is, um, cause this has always been fascinating about materials and concrete and, and, and last and I always associate with this, this use of rough, rough con and textured concrete. And obviously I, 
Uh, UEA I know slightly, but the National Theatre we all know very well. And those those rough those planks of wood that are the imprint of the wood on the landscape. And I was, I was fascinated to maybe just say a little bit more about the type of concrete used at UEA and with Brenda Colvin, you know, so that it's because it's very, it is you use that word picturesque, and I mean that, that that's something that you know that goes back to the Gothic and the picturesque in the 18th century about de deliberately rusticating materials. Um, I think that uh, when, when I was doing the research on Laston, uh, Laston uh, had died, but uh, I spoke to his wife, uh, Susan Laston, and uh, one of the things that I, I found very memorable um, was that it made, made me think every time you now go past the National Theatre uh, and see the, uh, the fly tower, I think it's really good to remember her words, but she said that her husband was frightfully romantic about Rain Street concrete. And I think it's a rather beautiful quote. And he was uh, very interested in the decay of concrete and the, how it actually uh, was weathered and worn. Uh, and he described the, um, the buildings, uh, the sort of decay of the buildings at UEA as the, like uh, it gave, it was like the character that you got from the lines on a face. And uh, very sadly, um, UEA has actually uh, reacted by putting a fungal inhibitor over all the buildings there. Uh, and when I was doing research, I actually, um, one person who was very interesting and helpful was actually the person who's the head of facilities at UA. Uh, and he sort of recognized the conflict that they were facing because, um, uh, and he implied that actually the, some of the heritage bodies were encouraging the, the preservation of buildings with the use of the fungal inhibitor. And obviously it's a c complex sort of argument, but one of the things that I spoke to with Susan last night, when she said about how horrified her husband would be the fact that the buildings were actually cleaned and the, the and repaired and, and Lasden would have wanted the, the decay to be left evident. And actually, if you go there today, you, today, you see this rather sort of strange sort of um, magnolia sort of uh, splurge uh, all sort of covering the buildings. Yes, it, it looks less like an inhibitor than, a, <laughs> than some sort of weird fungus that's actually sprayed on it. It's very unattractive. It's very, it's very weird to look at it, yeah. yeah. And going back to Laz, I remember Laz himself talking, talking about how he liked to stroke the walls of the National Dundee and then the interior of the, of the, and the texture, which, which led, led me, and I never actually looked at it that way, to, to become much more of an admirer of the texture of the National Theatre. I've got a question here from Romy Romweber. A uh, straightforward question. It says, is the ziggurat architecture still in existence? Um, I'm not quite sure whether that means generally or whether it refers to UEA. I mean, certainly the UEA buildings are there, but as I say, the strange thing is that you will, um, it was very interesting one, obviously I saw the buildings about um, 10 years ago, uh, 10, 15 years ago, when they were really decayed, magnificently decayed. Uh, and then the university started to clean them. And there was this rather strange moment when one of the ziggurats had been cleaned of all the fungus uh, and had been sort of painted with this sort of magnolia, strange magnolia covering. And then another one was decayed, so you could see one and against the other. Well, I think now they've all been um, repaired, sadly. Mm. But what you see today is not really what Lasden intended. No, not quite. Do we have any other questions? I have no more questions, written questions on my screen. I have one that refers to earlier, but I, I think I'd rather stick with, with the present uh, at the moment. Uh, perhaps I could ask Alicia a question about technology, because it's you mentioned in passing the technological kind of input in this imperial. To what extent was was Hong Kong a, a kind of experimental station? I don't know in terms of what was what happening technologically at that key moment in the mid nineteenth century. It's difficult. You showed a few structures which perhaps demonstrated that, but I wasn't quite sure. Just busy looking at them. Um, well, it's certainly it's certainly an experimental um, kind of entrepot botanically, um, in terms of um, and and also in terms of public health. Um, there really is a a kind of a great kind of round of different different kinds of structures that get built in order to try and deal with um, malaria, essentially. And so many schemes are put forward. In terms of the, the kind of materials of buildings, um, usually what they're dealing with is the cross application of materials that come from other, um, sometimes come from other places in the empire or sometimes are 
you know, described as native. Um, and people are very interested in the different, um, uh, the different properties of these and whether they might you know, become commodities that can be moved around in their own right. Um, there is a lot of, uh, there's also quite a bit of building that is very temporary. So in that sense, there's also a kind of a lot of experiment with materials in that, in that sort of, you know, things are, are put up and knocked down and other structures are put up. Yeah. So is there, a, I mean, can, is there a great deal of money going into this or is it, or is it the sort of element of the transience as you just said there as well? Um, both. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so some some things are are put up at great expense, and other things are are subject to um, kind of quite innovative economies. The the standard house type um, is uh, a, a lot of the, the houses that are built, particularly for the Chinese community in the period immediately after this, are um, the timber is shipped from Singapore, um, yeah. and they're put up like prefab structures essentially. Okay. I'm just looking at the Q&A there. Does anybody else want to say anything specific to these two papers that we've just uh, listened to? Otherwise, we can uh, open it up because we, uh, to all four papers. Um, I had a question from earlier on, and uh, this is from Juliet Carey. This just came in just before we started, and this one's for Freya. And... Uh, Juliet's interested in looking at, she says it might be worth looking at mid-century British sculpture's interest in native stones, chosen in preference to Italian stone, and obviously she examples Henry Moore. Uh, and that, that's an interesting question, I think. Um, it's a really um, helpful suggestion, thanks. Um, I guess I've only read this from art historians um, commenting on artworks, but certainly if you follow the Palazzi line, someone like Henry Moore had such a, a major emphasis on the kind of form and a, and a, and a, a clean surface that, that could, he may be going down a slightly different road, but it's, I think looking at other sculptures is good. I think she also had a question about travertine. Can I answer that? Yes, that yes, that's right. Uh, Juliet says, um, uh, and uh, she says, my, co my comment was made apropos to the question of why not travertine? And yeah. that's, you know, when you're going back, back to, you know, why Roach, why not travertine? Yeah, I, I've thought about this a bit more. I mean, I think there is the, the sort of things we've touched on, also Jonathan pointing out about weathering. Um, I'm not sure travertine weathers as well as Roach, and they were concerned with the weather. Um, it sounds like post war architects were thinking about weather and the effects of. of mm of climate and weather on, on, on stone, not just from a conservation point, but also from a, from a visual aspect. Um, so I, I don't think travertine weathers as well as roach, which is incredibly hardy. As I said in my mm. talk, it does get used for sea defences. Um, and, ro and roach has a smooth, smooth surface, doesn't it? I mean, it, it can be plain smooth, yeah, you just got yeah. these cavities in it. Um, but even you said it was also used as aggregate? Yeah, I was interested in it. Yeah, it got used in, um, as an aggregate in the concrete for the for the for the paving of the plaza. For the floor, yeah. Yeah, um, I guess also Jonathan's point about maybe it being local. I'm playing slightly devil's advocate by suggesting that, um, you know, if vision is self-historical, then the Smithsons like the stone at this particular moment because of a kind of feed in from France. So I'm, I'm being a bit cute about suggesting that maybe this is this is you know this is a french thing but yeah those that why not travertine whether local stone and there may have been a cost factor because i mean the romans used tra travertine to build aqueducts and all sorts of things yeah so, yeah well that's where you stuff. see it much you much know? much earlier in ancient history yeah um, you no know, so i the building that i'm most familiar with just because of the yale connection is the yale center for british art the way the interiors of course are, are, are covered in travertine and uh, one of the big issues that they had was, was it, it, well obviously it wasn't weather and it wasn't the outside was was the actual the, the, the grease and the oil and, and the materials that got into the travertine it, it, apparently it's very difficult to clean once it's actually you know within the surface of the of the of the, of the uh, uh, limestone itself mm. 
Anything else? Anybody? Yeah, oh, because any of the panelists want to say anything more about uh, either their own or anybody else's contributions today. And we feel that we're getting to the, the two hour mark. Alicia, yeah, you, if you mute, unmute yourself, unmute yourself, can you? Pressing the wrong button. All right. Um, yes, this, this is a question for, for Jonathan about, um, about trees with which you, you started in the urban context. And I'm wondering about you know, some of what you were saying about the ways in which um, the, the, uh, the built parts of the, um, of these of the not of the uh, the Norfolk campus were aging, um, and it's a you know a perennial kind of problem of garden restoration. Um, what do you do with the you know, the trees that have gotten too big and are now romantic rather than picturesque? Um, and I wondered about um, the aging of planting in these uh, these sixties era landscapes and how that. If you, if you uh, either have any ideas about how that is being dealt with or is being conceptualized. Jonathan, if you unmute yeah. yourself. Yeah, thank you. One of the things that um, I, I really enjoyed was going to the Colvin and Mogridge archive. And Colvin and Mogridge, the, the firm is still um, practicing and Brenda Colvin's not alive, but Al Mogridge is. And they have a very interesting sense of archive and it was, one of the first things they did when they were when Brenda Colvin was appointed to the role at UEA was to do this very extensive survey of uh, the uh, site for the university, and it's very interesting because it's a sort of it, it, it's part it, it had a funny history. It was a, uh, a sort of picturesque parkland, and then sort of picturesque field, and then became a golf course. So it had this rather, and the golf course partly was one of the reasons why some of the trees survived. But I think there was an awareness of the enjoying decayed trees, ruined trees, in the same way as enjoying a ruined church. And I always think it's, it's revealing that, you know, William uh, Kent actually proposed the planting of dead trees for Kensington Gardens. And there's such a strong sense of the awareness of time uh, in that, that I think it's um, on one level, I think that Colin and Mogridge uh, appreciated the the passage of time, but they did sort of see the landscape as a sort of marker of time. And Brenda Colvin actually uh, wrote, she did a privately um, published little book very late in her life. And sadly, it's never been published called Wonder in the World. That is very much about this idea about humanity trying to step back from its role of, of dominance uh, in relationship to, to nature and allowing nature as far as possible to take its course, but realize how uh, involved in that process we are. And I, I, I think it's one of the things that why architects personally have a lot to learn from our landscape architects, because landscape architects tend to be far more aware of time than architects do. And architects tend to still design for an ideal, a particular moment in time, while a landscape architect if you said that to a landscape architect, you know, it would be a slightly ridiculous statement, really. Yeah. I always think of uh, the, whenever I go around the circus in Bath, with John Wood's great idea is that you'd have this, this area where it would be sports and play and, you know, all sorts of healthy athletic games. But now it's full of these huge, massive, uh, I think they're playing trees. It's totally yeah. I always had this terrible joke I used to say to students about how you couldn't see the wood for the trees. Uh, but I... I <laughs> I won't push that. Um, two minutes to two. Um, so if, and all, uh, unless Danny or Ella, if there's anything else that, that we need to say. Um, Can I ask a final question if possible? Um, yeah, yeah. Anna, yeah. Piping up. Um, I was, um, I'm really interested in um, Jonathan's comments on landscape architects. And I was just wondering if you could tell us about any kind of continuity or um, between the likes of um, of Colvin and and the kind of modernist landscape architects Christopher Tunnard and Geoffrey Jellicoe, what, is there some continuity? Is there a real is there a real discourse between those practices? Is that something you could comment on? Um, I, I'm, I'm less aware of. I mean, I know a bit about Jellicoe's work and I know uh, Tunnard's work, but I think that um, but Colvin's a very interesting figure because I don't think. Um, you can really necessarily classify her as a modernist. 
well, you can sort of take certain sort of landscape architects of that era and say, yes, they were categorically modernist. But I think uh, Brenda Colvin had a much more uh, longer historical understanding. And, and one of the things that I find very interesting about that period of time, I, I would, for example, I would describe um, Dennis Lasden as a uh, pre-modernist, a modernist and a post-modernist. Uh, and I think it's possible to see Colvin in the same light. And actually Nicholas Pedsner described um, uh, Lasden and Le Cabuzier as post-modern uh, in the mid sixties, uh, 10 years before Charles Jenkins. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you all. And, uh... I just like to thank again our four speakers, Freya, you and Alicia and, and Jonathan. That was, that was a tremendous session and four excellent papers. And just to remind you, do go to the website because it, we've got a packed agenda for British Art and Natural, Natural Forces coming up over the next uh, month and or so. The next event is on the 22nd of October, which is Thursday, Apocalyptic Conjunctures, the Weather of Art History, and that's Andrew Patrizio who's giving a keynote there. And then uh, I won't scroll through everything else, but you see there's plenty of activity which takes us right the way into early December. And who knows where we're going to be at that point. <laughs> uh, so thanks for attending and thanks to our speakers. And